of the earth, lazily rotating to the silent voids of space, is the Arthur C. Clarke Astronomical Observatory, Star Lab. Here, Earth's International Space Authority, ISA, watches over countless uncharted galaxies and the planets that lie within their star-clustered borders. One of those planets is Tinian III, site of the top-secret Starsmith project. Beyond the atmosphere of Tinian III, a sudden, unexplainable incident whose momentum will soon carry Star Lab Research Director Maura Cassidy, Captains John Graydon and Buddy Griff, and the Starsmith project itself into the unknown territory of alien worlds. <laughs> Identified ship at 168 degrees, bearing 1,000 meters and closing. Over. Roger, Xanadu, I'm picking it up too. Switch to visual. Let's have a look at her. Over. Uh, Roger, we've got it on the visual. Oh my god, it's enormous. El Dorado, do you recognize the markings? Over. Uh, negative, Xanadu. Wait a minute, Bill. I'm picking up a tractor beam generator impulse from the UFO. They've locked onto us, Xanadu. They're overriding our shielding circuit. Bill, I see another tractor beam nozzle. Get out of here. Dive. Xanadu, we're inside the UFO. They're closing the hatch on us. I can see. Starlab Control, this is the Xanadu trainer. We have a condition. Red alert. Repeat. Red alert. Coordinates 5, 9, or 5. Do you read? Over. Starlab Control to Xanadu Trader. Starlab Control to Xanadu Trader. There's too much static on this frequency. Switch to subchannel 4. Uh, Roger, Starlab Control, subchannel 4. How do you read me now? Over. 4 by loud and clear. Go ahead. We've just been attacked by an unidentified alien vessel. Huge. Twice the size of a Viking class cruiser. What's your location, Xanadu? We're orbiting in a descent vector over Timian 3. Triangulator coordinates 5, 9, or 5. Any damage? A negative, but the other freighter is gone. The El Dorado, she was orbiting with us. Destroyed? No, the alien didn't fire a shot. They locked onto the El Dorado with a tractor beam and took her aboard through some kind of recovery hatch. But what was the El Dorado's cargo? Same as mine. Classified hardware for the Starsmith project. That's right, Commissioner. The alien was after both of them. The captain of the Xanadu trader said if he hadn't taken evasive action, the tractor beam would have snatched him, too. Well, I don't know how they found out, but it's obvious the aliens knew exactly what those two freighters were carrying. What makes you think so, Commissioner? Well, dozens of commercial vessels use the Timian 3 shipping lanes every day, Mara. All of them filled to the bulkheads with priceless cargo. Yet this alien goes after the only two ships carrying classified scientific equipment of the Starsmith project. Well, somewhere, somehow, there's been a security leak. Well, what do you want us to do? Where are Graydon and Griff? They're out patrolling the Corona Echo intersect in Delta One. Well, call them back to Starlab. I'll be up on the next shuttle. All right, yes, sir. Jerry. Uh, yes, Mara. Contact Delta One. I'll be down in a minute. Okay, Mara. Delta One coming up. Skipper, take a look at the echo pattern on G-Monitor. The diameter of the Corona Major star cloud is nearly three parsecs bigger than it was a year ago. Huh. Well, that's what evolution is all about, buddy. Constant change. Limitless expansion. I wonder what Copernicus and Galileo would have done if they knew just exactly how... Star Lab Control to Delta One. Star Lab Control to Delta One. Uh, Delta One to Star Lab Control. Go ahead, Jerry. Buddy? John, return to Star Lab immediately. ISA orders. Wow, Skipper, talk about evolution. It sounds like Jerry's turned into the sweetheart of Sigma 5. 
I heard that. <laughs> Very funny, buddy. Uh, but the joke will be on you if you're not here when Commissioner White arrives. Oh, the Commissioner White? Star of stage, screen, and telescan monitor? Uh, John, what's wrong with Buddy? Too much nitrous oxide in his oxygen? Uh, too much stargazing, Mora. I finally got to <laughs> a likely story. What's the problem, Mora? Why is the Commissioner coming up? ISA thinks there's been a security leak at the Starsmith Project on Timian 3. That's all I know. The Starsmith Project. All right, Mora. We're on our way. Delta 1 out. A huge alien spacecraft hijacks a freighter in the shipping lanes over Timian 3. A second freighter barely escapes. The cargo of both vessels? Classified scientific equipment for the Starsmith Project. A secret ISA installation on Timian 3. A lonely, Earth-like planetoid orbiting at the threshold of alien worlds. hijacking over Timian 3 by a mysterious alien ship and the suspicion of a security leak at ISA's top secret Starsmith project on Timian brings Captain John Graydon and Buddy Griff back to Star Lab from a routine surveying mission. I never heard of the Starsmith project, Mora. What is it? Search me, buddy. Well, I don't mind if I do. <laughs> John, I think we'd better depressurize Buddy's libido before it's too late. Ah, saved from a fate worse than death. <laughs> Hiya, Kamesh. Hello, Buddy. John, Mora. Hello, Hello Commissioner. Commissioner. Have you told him about the freighter hijacking, Mora? Yes, sir. All right, here's the rest of it. Three months ago, Professor Logan Starsmith came up with a workable blueprint for a new hyperdrive unit, the SPA-1 the Starsmith Parsec Accelerator. It won't replace the HD-4 units now in service, but used in conjunction with them, the SPA-1 will increase their power by a warp factor of 10. A warp factor of 10? Well, that's a five magnitude increase. That's right, John. Now, our defense system depends on having the fastest ships in the galaxy, and to prevent the SPA-1 from falling into the wrong hands, we've kept it under wraps. We even had the various components built at separate locations. Now, two weeks ago, we reopened the ISA Plasmatron Laboratory on Timian 3 so Starsmith could assemble the unit. He took some of the components with him. The rest were aboard the Eldorado and the Xanadu Trader. Well, how many people knew what the freighters were carrying? Only Starsmith. The freighters were loaded three days ago. He ordered them up himself. Well, when did you find out? He didn't contact ISA until the ships were orbiting Timian. Well, if there's been a security leak, Starsmith would seem to be the obvious suspect. Well, that's what we thought at first, but there's no motive. He's rich, respected, dedicated, completely devoted to his family. He's also one of those typically isolated geniuses whose concept of an alien is someone who sneaks into the country without a passport. Well, what do you want us to do? Go to Timian 3. Bring back Starsmith. We'll keep him here till we can figure out what's going on. Besides, I think a few days rest will do him good. Hmm. What makes you say that? Well, something I learned this morning from his assistant, Frank Baxter. He and Starsmith were taking a walk last night when Starsmith stopped, stared up into the sky for a long time, and then he said, all my children are dying. And then he started to cry. Professor Starsmith, it's Frank. I can't talk to you now, Frank. It's important, Professor. A message from Star Lab. What does it say? What do they want? They're sending a ship for you. For me? Why? Professor, what's wrong? Haven't you slept? You look... Look? How do I look, Frank? Old? Tired? Professor, I will... You what, Frank? Care about how I look? Why? When did the young ever care about the old? Professor, you know, ever since last night... Why are they taking me to Star Lab? Well, in view of what happened yesterday, the Commissioner feels you'll be a lot safer there. Well, what about you? I'll be all right. 
ISA is sending a fighter squadron to patrol Timian in case the alien does come back, but they don't want to take any chances where you're concerned. Besides, someone has to stay here and keep an eye on things. All right. I'll go. I'm going to miss you, Frank. Are you still here? Yes, Logan. I'm still here. Then please finish with me, for God's sake. I can't stand the pain. An alien voice in the dark. A sudden swirl of shimmering golden rainbows. Then, silence as Professor Logan Starsmith is drawn into the sunless void between being and nothingness. Meanwhile, aboard Delta One, John Graydon and Buddy Griff are crossing another void, the space between Starlab and Timian Three, a distance normally measured in days, about to be compressed into one measured in minutes. Okay, Buddy, let's start the switch over to hyperdrive. Pulse converters? Pulse converters. Check. Shift register circuits A through E. A through E. Check. Sequencer links to substatus green. Substatus green. Check. Primary and secondary parsec refractors. Parsec refractors are in phase. All right. Synchronize timers for a minus 15 interface. And hold on to your hat. Timers are set and counting. Hat is firmly gripped. Check. Check. Only Vertebrae Brown could see us now. Who knows, buddy? Someday, if we stay in hyperdrive long enough, maybe he will. We're through. There's Timian. You all right, Skipper? Uh, yeah, fine. <laughs> How about you? Okay. Except that now I'm three days late for my date with that cute little Mycroft technician. Three days late? Yeah. We were supposed to go out the day after tomorrow. Right. Roger, Delta One. Stay aboard. We'll rotate the pad. Professor Starsmith will be right there. Uh, Roger, Timmy in control. Tell him to use the starboard ramp. We've already got the hatch open. Uh, Roger, Delta One. Personnel ramp five. Professor? All right, Lieutenant. Thank you. You're sure you're all right, Professor? Yes, Frank, I'm sure. I was just going through one of those neurotic episodes we so-called eccentric geniuses are famous for. Well, I'll do my best to hold things together while you're gone. Excuse me, Professor, but you'd better hurry. The magnetic storm we've been tracking is moving in fast. Another 15 minutes and you won't be able to launch. I'll be in touch, Frank. Goodbye, Professor. Take care of yourself. Buddy, go back and sit with the professor to warp through. I can handle the switch over. You know, I still can't believe that the guy who came up with the most fantastic parsec accelerator of all time has never been through parsec acceleration himself. <laughs> yeah. I think men like him hide out in their private mathematical worlds because they're afraid of what their discoveries might lead to. Look at Einstein. He presented his atomic chain reaction theories to the government and was kept in the dark about the bomb until it was finished. You know, it would be great if the professor had a really nifty daughter. <clears throat> um, any reason in particular, aside from the obvious ones? Mm-hmm. We'd never get tired of each other. As long as the professor was there to keep shuffling time around, it would always be love at first sight. Buddy, please see about making the professor comfortable. Uh, right, Skip. How you doing, Professor? A little nervous, but other than that, I'm fine. Well, you'll experience a little blurred vision at light speed, but that'll clear up as soon as we warp through. Don't worry about a thing. I'll be right here beside you all the way. I appreciate that, Captain. Thank you. All right, gentlemen. Timers are synchronized for a minus 10 interface. See you on the other side. Captain Griff! Captain Griff! 
Please, please, help me. Oh, my God. My God, Professor. Skipper. Skipper, something's happening to the Professor. Buddy, what's wrong? Oh, my God, he's, he's shriveling up. He's, he's, he's dehydrating. I can see his cheekbones. Rainbows. Golden rainbows are spilling out of his eyes. As Buddy Griff looks on, helpless, Professor Logan Starsmith undergoes a strange and terrifying metamorphosis. An unexplainable transformation that slowly reveals he is neither terrestrial nor humanoid, but is instead an inhabitant of alien worlds. Returning to Starlab from Tinian 3, Delta-1 has warped through the time-space continuum, a routine hyperdrive procedure normally harmless to both terrestrials and extraterrestrials. But as Buddy Griff looks on in disbelief and John Graydon frantically radios ahead, their passenger, Professor Logan Starsmith, as a result of the warp through, is undergoing an astonishing transfiguration. You heard me the first time, Jerry. The professor is changing into some kind of alien life form. Notify Mora and the commissioner, and tell Dr. Rossiter to get down to sick bay and open up the alienology unit. And get us aboard now. Whoever this creature is, he's dying. Starlab control to all incoming traffic. Hold your positions. We have an emergency. Dr. Rossiter, report to sick bay. Prepare the alienology unit. Starlab to Delta One. Red Vector Approach 589er, Bay 14, Level C. I'm opening the doors now. As Delta-1 orbits into an emergency docking vector with Starlab, another drama unfolds on the distant planet of Nikona, an alien world on the verge of extinction beneath a dying sun. Emperor Mika sits alone in the Imperial Tower of the Nikonian Citadel, awaiting the return of the ship he sent on a desperate mission to another galaxy. Mika. What is it, Ariana? Our recovery ship has returned from Timian 3. Have the accelerator components been unloaded? Mika, our ship was able to take only one of the Earth transports. The other one flew out of tractor beam range before we had... I don't care to listen to any excuses today, Ariana. I ordered both ships to be taken. They weren't. I don't know how much longer I can tolerate having my orders disobeyed. Mika, please. The life element supply aboard our ship was subcritical. If they had pursued the other transport, they might not have come back at all. I feel they did their best under the circumstances. I think we have reached a point where what you feel is no longer important, Ariana. First, you convinced me to support Matip's plan, which has obviously failed. Now, you stand there and suggest that failure to carry out a direct imperial edict is acceptable under the circumstances. Mika! Nekona is dying. That is our only reality. And survival by any means possible is our only concern. Disobedience and failure, regardless of the circumstances, are inexcusable, and they have no place in an unforgiving and uncompromising universe. There was a time when you understood failure. Was there? I doubt it. What's being done with the crew of the capture transport? They're being held in the Legionnaires' quarters. Have them taken to the cells. No, Mika, I won't. There's no reason to make them suffer your disappointment. I see. Andros. Yes, Mika? Take the crew of the Earth ship to the suffocation chambers. Yes, Mika. Stop it, Mika! Stop it. I'll have them taken to the cells. Ignore my order, Andros. Yes, Mika. You see how useless it is to oppose me, Ariana? I know you think I have become a sadistic tyrant. But I am the Emperor of Nekona, and our situation is desperate. Unlike you, I have no affection for Earthlings. And if I have to execute ten, or twenty, or even a thousand, 
to maintain your obedience to me, I shall do it. I am sorry, Ariana. I never thought it would come to this. It came to this two solar years ago, Mika, when you ordered the construction of the first suffocation chamber. Meanwhile, on Starlab, Delta One has docked, and the mysterious being Professor Starsmith has become lies near death in Starlab's alienology unit. Collapse in 1723, UIT. Mark, right and left lobes are 100%. What are his chances, Diana? We won't know until Mycroft finishes analyzing the pathological data. But if his body fluids keep misting out of him like this, he won't last another hour. Uh, Sandy? Yes, Doctor? How are you coming with the anti-dehydration chamber? Just a few more minutes. Captain Grip, you said his eyes were hemorrhaging golden rainbows. How long do they do that? Well, it all happened so fast. 15, 20 seconds, maybe. Were his eyes transparent before the hemorrhage or after? Before. His eyes changed and then the rainbows just spilled out. What is it, Diana? You have that look on your face. The eye phenomena. I've read about it before. Uh, Captain Graydon, did you witness any part of the reversal process? No, no, I didn't. Uh, by the time I got to the passenger deck, Professor Starsmith was gone, and this alien was there, strapped in next to Buddy. Diana, why does he still have one human hand? His bioenergy discharged too fast during the reversal to neutralize all the exterior synthetic tissue. It'll disappear if we can get him stabilized. If? Diana, we've got to. He's the only one who knows where Professor Starsmith is and what this whole incident is all about. The chamber's ready, Doctor. Thank you, Sandy. Oh, uh, Sandy, see what you can find in the alien medicine bank on ophthalmic hemorrhage reaction. I'll call you from the display terminal. Let's get him into the chamber. Maura, if you'll just open the main Dying chamber. Children, Siata, Ut, Omitas, Matibsa, I'll miss you, Frank. Linguistics, it's Dr. Cassidy. I want two Omnivox technicians and a portable phonetics decoder in the alienology unit immediately. Riata, Forma, Anissa, thank you, Captain Griff. Buddy, he's talking to you. Why me? You were the last life form he saw before the transformation. Uh, I, I don't know what to say to him. Dr. Rossiter, Sandy, the alien is an inhabitant of the Nikonian Empire. Nikona, of course. Sandy, is the pathological data ready? It just came off. I'm on my way down with it. Matibsa. Matibsa. I'll miss you. Captain Griff. Diana! Diana, he's not breathing. Do something. Oh, I'm sorry, Mara. He's gone. I'm going to miss you, Frank, 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 Frank. Frank. Delta One hyperdrives through the time-space continuum as Professor Logan Starsmith is mysteriously transformed into a being from another galaxy. A creature so badly injured by the warp-through ordeal that Dr. Diana Rossiter, Starlab's executive physician, is unable to save him. And somewhere in the vast reaches of space beyond Starlab, the real Professor Starsmith waits lost behind one of those countless secret doors that open onto alien worlds.
The Starsmith Project was based on a story by Ellen Pellicero and written by Ellen Pellicero, Ron Thompson, and Lee Hansen. Associate producer, Jeff Allen. Music director, Tom Rounds. Engineer, Stu Jacobs. Assistant to the producer, Laurie Tyler. Technical consultant, Peter Skye. Alien Worlds was created, produced, and directed by Lee Hansen. And so, until next time, this is Roger Dressler inviting you to join us for the conclusion of the Starsmith Project on Alien Worlds. silent voids of space is the Arthur C. Clarke Astronomical Laboratory, Star Lab. Here, the International Space Authority, ISA, watches over an eternity of uncharted galaxies and the countless planets that orbit within their starlit boundaries. On one of those planets, Timian III, Professor Logan Starsmith and his staff await the arrival of the components for Starsmith's latest invention, a new hyperdrive unit known as the SPA-1. But as the two freighters carrying the SPA-1 components orbit into a descent vector over Timian, one of them, the Xanadu trader, radios an urgent message to Starlab Control. We've just been attacked by an unidentified alien vessel. Huge. Twice the size of a Viking-class cruiser. Any damage? A negative, but the other freighter is gone. The El Dorado. She was orbiting with us. But destroyed? No, the alien didn't fire a shot. They locked onto the El Dorado with a tractor beam and took her aboard through some kind of recovery hatch. As news of the hijacking reaches Commissioner White, he calls a hurried conference with SET commanders John Graydon and Buddy Griff, along with Star Lab Research Director Maura Cassidy. Well, how many people knew what the freighters were carrying? Only Starsmith. The freighters were loaded three days ago. He ordered them up himself. Well, if there's been a security leak, Starsmith would seem to be the obvious suspect. Well, that's what we thought at first, but there's no motive. Well, what do you want us to do? Go to Timian 3. Bring back Starsmith. We'll keep him here till we can figure out what's going on. Besides, I think a few days rest will do him good. John and Buddy leave Star Lab aboard Delta One and warp through the time-space continuum, reducing the distance to Timian 3 from days to minutes. During the return warp through, Professor Starsmith undergoes a strange and terrifying transformation. Oh my God, he's, he's shriveling up, he's, he's, he's dehydrating. I can see his cheekbones. Rainbows, golden rainbows are spilling out of his eyes. <laughs> Docking at Star Lab, John and Buddy rush the being Starsmith has become to the alienology unit in sickbay. But just as Dr. Diana Rossiter is about to put the alien into the anti-dehydration chamber... Matibsa! Matibsa! I'll miss you, Captain Griff. He's not breathing. Do something. Oh, I'm sorry, Mara. He's gone. Still retaining the synthetic human hand he was unable to neutralize during his morphogenetic reversal, the alien slowly closes his transparent eyes. As part two of the Starsmith Project unfolds within the interstellar spaces of alien worlds. <laughs> Right and left lobes are 100% negative function. Body temperature is centigrade. Doctor, look. His hand is dissolving. Let's get him into the chamber. There still might be a chance. You mean he's not dead? If he were, the hand would calcify, not dissolve. I think he's lapsed into a pre-death coma. I hope we haven't run out of time. Here's his data, Dr. Rossiter. T 
TOS profile, pathological readout, and neuro tracings. Mm -hmm. Nitrogen, oxygen, neon theta, hydrogen, parogen violet. His cells are 92% parogen violet. Sandy, flood the chamber with an osmotic vapor of 80% parogen violet and 20% neon theta. All right, doctor. Maura, turn on the chamber microphone. This one? The red switch, yes, that's it. Captain Griff, I'm right here. I was afraid. You don't have to be afraid anymore. We're all here to help you. Then you should know me. I am Matib, a thought magician from the Neconian Empire in the galaxy of Cerisias. Buddy, ask him what Professor Starsmith is. Wh whose voice is that, Captain Griff? My name is Mara, a friend of Captain Griff's. We're concerned about Professor Starsmith. His spirit is within me. His form is safe on Nakona. Is, is there a physician among you? Yes, Matib. My name is Diana. Are you monitoring my heart pulsations, Diana? Yes. I'm beginning to feel the symptoms of perigen violet saturation. When I finish speaking... Reduce the osmotic infusion 10% every 25 pulses and remove me from the chamber. An alien thought magician is saved from death by executive physician Rossiter. Although Professor Logan Starsmith's body is safe on Nikona, his spirit still resides within Matib. Exactly why and how Matib assumed Starsmith's body remains a mystery, one which moves them deeper into an alien world. His health and strength restored Matib is removed from the anti-dehydration chamber and taken to a recovery unit in sickbay, where he explains the mysterious chain of events which have brought him to Star Lab. As the light of our sun diminishes, so does the perigen violet content of our atmosphere. Those of us in our middle years have been slowly mutating ourselves in order to survive with reduced amounts of the life element. But because our children and elders lack the strength for cell mutation, they've been dying at the rate of 500 a day. Is there any way you can save yourselves? Our only choice is migration to a planet with a high atmospheric content of perigen violet. We know of one, but it's 2,000 light years from home. And without Professor Starsmith's invention, we'll never reach it in time. Our ships are too slow. Why didn't you simply come to us and ask for help? Emperor Mika doesn't trust you. He knows that the history of Earth is one of almost fatal devotion to the extremes of pleasure, pain, and power. And to Mika, all extremes have their basis in fear and deceit. Well, I think we'd all have to agree with that, Mati, but things have changed during the past century. I realize that, Commissioner, but Mika doesn't. He's old. Perigen violet anoxia has all but destroyed his logic and reason. He no longer understands the universal constant of change and that it affects all sentient beings. There was a time when he would have come to you himself, but now... Well, how did you find out about the project? It was top secret. There are no secrets from someone who can become anyone. I was a Parsec engineer at the component facility in New Chicago. I was the navigation officer aboard the Xanadu trader. And finally, I was Professor Starsmith. We've always been aware of Earth's technological skills, and we knew it would only be a matter of time before one of your scientists devised a revolutionary hyperdrive unit. I spent three years at the new Chicago facility, waiting. Where are the men whose bodies you biosynthesized? They were held in cryosuspension on Nakona then returned one by one as I cycled through their various identities. But what about the time missing from their lives? Nothing is missing, Captain Graydon. 
All I experienced in their places was given to them when I returned their spirits. They're not even aware they've been gone. How did you manage to get Professor Starsmith to Nakona? A number of storage tunnels under the project complex opened several hundred meters beyond the laboratory. Last night, I left Professor Starsmith at the mouth of one of them. A Nakonian lander picked him up at moonset. Martib, would you be willing to try and convince Mika that in exchange for Professor Starsmith and the crew of the El Dorado, ISA will give him all the Parsec accelerators your planet needs? Yes. When will you be able to leave? As soon as Captain Griff is ready. You know something, Matib? I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. How much further to the warp through, Meridian, buddy? Uh, two minutes, 40 seconds. Matib, are you certain you'll be all right during Parsec acceleration? As long as I only have to sustain one body, faster than light speed is as harmless to me as it is to you. Skipper, we have three Piranha-class players at 282 degrees, 5,000 meters in closing. Magnify 1,000, and let's have a look at them on B-monitor. Captain, those are Naconian Spectrum Raiders. Something's wrong. Mika's never sent a patrol out this far before. 1,000 meters in closing. 500 meters in closing. Captain, open a close proximity subfrequency. Niata Lux Neconia, Niata Lux Neconia, Lumerian Matipsa, Matipsa, Teres Noxo. Matipsa, do a most out of truth. Mika Imperius Benarius, Niatum Teranaxo. They have orders to destroy any Earthship they see. Mika believes I was taken to Star Lab and killed. The pilot thinks my voice is a deception. They're gonna nail us next time, Skipper. Please, don't fire on them, Captain. They're not aware of the real situation. Hmm. Uh, buddy, uh, open the starboard fuel bay and jettison the primary liquid oxygen pod. And then get ready for an emergency warp through. The pod's jettisoned, Skipper. Okay. Now, when they start firing, blast the pod with our starboard laser cannons. And I'll warp through behind the explosion. We're through. Is everyone all right? Nice going, Skipper. We're in one piece, and they think we're scattered from here to the great beyond. An excellent maneuver, Captain Great. Nakona dead ahead, Skipper. You sure weren't kidding about your son, Matib. The photosphere barely registers on the solar scanner. Matib, are we approaching from the dark side? All of Nakona is dark. It has been for over two solar years. Uh, Captain Griff, if you'll program for a descent vector of 068, we'll land at a deserted ice flower plantation near the Citadel. As John, Buddy, and Matib approach Nikona aboard Delta One, Emperor Mika sits alone in one of the Nikonian Citadel's high towers. His spirit, weakened by perigen violet starvation, his mind suffocated by hallucinations. And then Nekona came out of the sun, and we came out of Nekona into a void of broken eyes and blood and darkness. Mika? What do you want, Ariana? The crew of the captured transport vessel. They're desperately in need of water. They can have all the water they need, but not until I've eased the suffering of our own people. Mika, please, they haven't That had... uh, will be all, Ariana. Yes, Mika. Ariana. Yes, Mika? Please, bring me a heart beam photon pistol. Why? You have no enemies here. Oh, but I do, Ariana. They live all around me, in the twilight and the shadows, the pistol. Ariana. Yes, Mika. Yes. The pistol. As Emperor Mika sits planning his revenge against a dark force of invisible enemies. John, Buddy, and Matib enter the subterranean corridors beneath the Neconian Citadel and make their way to one of Matib's cryo-laboratories. 
Professor Starsmith is in here. Matib, all these crystal pillars, what are they? Beautiful. These are the cryo chambers. Buddy, Professor Starsmith is standing inside this one. He looks all right, doesn't he? Captain Griff, if you touch that prism, the chamber will open. Captain Graydon, take these jewels and place the red one over the professor's left eye, the yellow one over his right eye, and the blue one in the center of his forehead. Like this? Yes. Now, please stand away or you may be harmed. Professor Starsmith. Professor Starsmith. Are you still here? Yes, Logan. I'm still here. As John and Buddy watch, two razor-thin beams of golden light erupt from the center of Matib's forehead and penetrate the iridescent jewels over Professor Starsmith's eyes. The gem on his forehead begins to oscillate, filling the white crystal chamber with a blinding ultra blue radiance. Matib begins to tremble, his bioenergy temporarily weakened, as he returns Professor Starsmith's spirit erasing the void between being and nothingness where the professor has been suspended in the dark sanctuaries of cryo-sleep. How do you feel, Logan? I feel a little dizzy, but uh, I'll be all right. Hello, Captain Graydon. Uh, Captain Griff? Hiya, Professor. Professor? I... Stand where you are, all of you. Mika! You were seen entering the Citadel, Monitoring you ever since. Legionnaires, take them to the cells. Skip, put your blaster away, buddy. The outnumber is ten to one. Surrounded by Imperial Legionnaires, John and Buddy are disarmed, and then, along with Matib and Professor Starsmith, are taken to a subterranean prison cell beneath the Niconian Citadel. Meanwhile, Mika listens to the hallucinatory voices that continue to flood his broken mind. Voices that insist even his friends are enemies, and that all enemies must be destroyed. Emperor Mika, a lonely dweller in a sad mirage at the very center of alien worlds. By Imperial Legionnaires, John, Buddy, Matib, and Professor Starsmith have been locked in a cell beneath the Niconian Citadel. And while Mika sits in one of the Citadel's high towers, deciding what to do with his prisoners, Matib has already determined what that decision will be. Unless we can confront him and convince him to listen, I'm certain he'll have us killed. Do you honestly believe he'd listen to you? Mika and I have known each other all our lives. I've experienced his kindness and generosity and wisdom throughout the years. I can't believe that everything he was has been lost. Well, if it isn't our boys in uniform. Professor Starsmith, please come with us. Sartos? Is that you? Yes, my team. Your helmet and faceplate, I, I didn't recognize you at first. Where are you taking the professor? To Mika. You can speak English here, Sartos. These are my friends. All of us are your friends, Matib. We want to help, but you know the penalty for violating an imperial edict, no matter how unfair it is. Uh, Professor Starsmith, please. Do you think he'll be all right? I don't know. Starsmith. Have him come in. Tell the guards to wait. Yes, Mika. Professor? Professor, I want you to contact your laboratory on Timian 3 and order the rest of the components to be transported here. If you refuse, I shall order the execution of the freighter crew. 
You don't have to threaten me, Mika. You can have all the Parsec accelerators you need. That's what Matib wanted to tell Matib has failed me. He didn't fail you. Without him, we'd never have learned how desperately you need our help. I don't want your help, Professor. Only your invention. Our own technicians are quite capable of assembling it. That would take months. You don't have that much time. If you let me supervise the assembly, it would only be a matter of weeks. Mika, I'm willing to stay here and help in any way I can. Like you helped certain races on your own planet? I'm familiar with your history, Professor. I know how ruling system like yours forced their way into other lands on the pretext of helping. And I know how you destroyed their cultures when they resisted you. What was the dominant political philosophy of that age? Burn the infants of one land so the earth could be made safe for the children of another land? That was a long, long time ago, Mika. I live in whatever time I choose, Professor. Now, shall we begin again? He's begun a long time, Atib. What do you think's going on up there? I don't know, Captain Graydon. I don't know. Ariana! There isn't much time. Meek is in a terribly violent state. Here are your weapons. Sartos gave them to me. Sartos? I knew he'd help us. He said he had no choice. Not after seeing you here. I'll leave the door open. Give me a few moments, then come to Mika's chamber through the tower passageway. And please, try not to hurt him. Well, things are certainly looking up. Who was that, Matib? Mika's daughter. I shall kill them, Professor. I'll kill them all. All right, Mika. But you've got to promise me that you... No promises, Professor. Now, please, follow me to the communications chamber. Mika, wait! Stand where you are, Matib. Mika, put that weapon aside. We don't want to harm you. Mika, please listen to him. Ariana, Ari Ariana, you set them free. Mika, we've come to help your planet, your people. No! Oh, Skipper, look out! Oh, Mika, stop it! Stop it! Ariana, Matib, I'm blind, I'm blind. Skipper, he shot himself. <laughs> I, I couldn't help myself, Ariana. The voices, they were inside. They were mine. All this time, I was only raging against myself. Oh, father. Uh, father. Realizing at last that his only enemies were the dark, distorted voices of his own sadly broken spirit, Emperor Mika becomes a victim of his own rage. Understanding in this final moment that only in the sanctity of death can the raging sound of one's own self be silenced, purified, and given back to that infinite, invisible place from which all things eventually return. There's good old Delta One, Skipper. Right where we left her. Right. Professor, what should we tell your family? Tell them I've come to my senses and finally realize that science exists not to serve itself, but to sustain the balance of life everywhere in the universe. Tell them Nakona desperately needs my help. And tell them I've seen a future in which we'll all be Nikonians someday. We'll be seeing you, Professor. So long, Professor, and good luck. Goodbye, Matib. Goodbye, my friend. Take care of him, Ariana. He's too good to lose. Thank you for bringing him back to us. Watch the skies, my good friends. We'll meet again. Ah.
Amicus Lux Eterna. Valerius and Niamus on the Calmanitus. Illyria Mantras Eterna Setum. Vias Noveriat Lux Eterna. The Starsmith Project was based on a story by Ellen Pellicero and written by Ron Thompson. Our cast included Linda Gary, Chuck Olson, Bruce Miller, and Corey Burton, with special guests Richard Paul, Byron Kane, Francis Bay, Lester Fletcher, Carol Bilger, and Gail Murphy. Associate producer Jeff Allen, music director Tom Rounds, our engineer was Stu Jacobs. Assistant to the producer, Lori Tyler. Technical consultant, Peter Skye. Alien Worlds was created, produced, and directed by Lee Hansen. And so, until next time, this is Roger Dressler inviting you to join us for another journey into Alien Worlds. Alien Worlds.